Good morning and welcome to the Tuesday, January 26th hearing of the Minnesota House Education Finance Committee. Remote hearings such as this are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted online and is linked to our public meeting notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members. Members have the contents of their virtual packets available to them. And for the public, these meeting materials have been posted online. Members, if you are looking for all these items in one place, they are attached in the calendar event that you have that Ms. Burt sent out for today. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hand via the app. Ms. Burt will place your name on the list to be recognized. If a member is on their phone and doesn't have access to the raise your hand feature, please email Ms. Burt and she will put your question in the queue. This is the digital equivalent of getting the attention of the chair or the committee administrator. An email from your house account with the subject line, please recognize, is all that is required if you're on the phone. Ms. Sunderland, would you please call the roll? Chair Dabney. Present. Vice Chair Sandstead. Oh. Present. Oh. Representative Cresha. Present. Representative Bennett. Present. Representative Daniels. Present. Representative Damus. Present. Representative Dreiskowski. Present. Representative Erickson. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Jordan. Present. Representative Marquardt. Present. Representative Mueller. Present. Representative Richardson. Present. Representative Thompson. Look here. Present. Representative Wolgamont. Present. Representative Zhang. Present. Representative Yuakim. Present. That is the roll and we do have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Sunderland. Uh, Representative Bennett, have you had a chance to review the minutes from our Thursday, January 21, 2021 meeting? Um, I have Mr. Chair and I moved those minutes. Thank you very much. Any discussion to the Bennett motion? Hearing none, this will be a voice vote. All in favor of the Bennett motion, approving the minutes from the Thursday, January 2021 20, meeting of this committee, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, uh, nay. The motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Bennett. Members, you've, you've heard me say it earlier in the uh, session that the two focuses for this committee are the pandemic and its impact on students, schools and families and the racial disparities in the state and those impacts. Uh, today is a uh, excellent opportunity for, for us to look at the challenges of meeting the academic and social emotional needs of students during the COVID-19 pandemic and possible solutions that uh, our school staff across the state are implementing. I did uh, have a chance to reflect this morning about just how hard public employees in various state aides and schools across the state have been working this past almost year now. Uh, and the debt of gratitude that we as policymakers, as parents, as community members owe them, uh, whether it's our Department of Health or your local public school district or your local public health uh, agency, uh, or others. So uh, with, with a little moment of gratitude there, um, I would like to have us first start by looking at some of the impacts of disputed learning. And with us today, I believe to kick off is Dr. Justin Killian uh, with Education Minnesota. Am I correct on that, Dr. Killian? That's correct, Mr. Chair. Excellent, thank you. If you would please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair Dabney and members of the House Education uh, Finance Committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Justin Killian, and I am an Education Issues Specialist with Education Minnesota. We'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, in the com or for being here and for allowing us to be here, I should say. In the coming days, Education Minnesota is going to release a policy paper on disrupted learning and the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a product of our EPIC program, which combines the classroom experiences of our members with the research recommendations of top education experts. This paper was directed by 22 of our 86,000 members who work in all regions of the state as teachers, special educators, education support professionals, behavioral interventionists, and student support specialists. I'm honored that three of the 22 that advise this paper will follow me to provide a deeper insight into our recommendations. So for months, political leaders around the state have been asking our 86,000 members, quote, how are the students doing during COVID-19, end quote. And we appreciate this question, but we fear one thing. We fear it comes from a concern about progress in reading and math alone and the looming statewide standardized assessments, which are the metrics we have used for too long to judge the quality and progress of public schools. So on behalf of the members of Education Minnesota and the advisory panel that put forward this paper, let me start with three facts. First, public schools in Minnesota were plagued by systemic racism and chronic underfunding for several decades before this pandemic. Yes, COVID-19 has exacerbated inequities and led to learning loss, but it is not the cause. It is merely the flashlight that is illuminating the structural problems that disadvantage too many of our students, especially our students of color. Second, researchers have recently coined the phrase the COVID slide to discuss the learning loss during the pandemic. There certainly has been learning loss and we will address that in a moment, but we must also remember that the COVID slide is about the socio-emotional and physical well-being of our students as well. Third, COVID-19 has caused major disruptions to the 2019-20 and 2020-21 school years, but we cannot pretend it's been the only disruption. Our students and educators have witnessed a presidential impeachment trial, a contentious presidential election, horrific destruction due to climate change, the death of over 400,000 Americans to this virus, the violent murders of black and brown citizens, and now a violent coup in our very democracy that has led to yet a second presidential impeachment. So to answer the original question, how are the students doing? Well, I'm here to tell you that our students are processing a lot of collective trauma at the moment. So with that, let me transition to three things. What do we know to be true? What can we predict? And what do our educators and students need? First, what do we know to be true about the current state of public education in Minnesota and the nation? National polls have showed us that about half of our students are experiencing new levels of chronic stress. And these numbers are more acute for our students of color. Educators are also experiencing unheard of levels of chronic stress with over 80% of them reporting that they fear contracting COVID-19 while at work. Second, hospitalizations due to mental health are on the rise in Minnesota and there is an increased worry among our membership that more of their students will die by suicide. Third, chronic absenteeism is on the rise. Fourth, Hunger, housing insecurity, and physical safety concerns are at the tops of minds of students and educators, and this makes focusing on math and reading a little hard at the moment. Finally, the digital divide in Minnesota is stark. We have approximately 250,000 students and 6,400 teachers without access to high-speed internet. We also have about 162,000 students and a little over 1,000 teachers that are without access to appropriate digital devices. If we dig deeper into those numbers, we know that about 22% of the students who lack digital access are either Black, Latinx, or Native American. So this is disproportionately affecting some of our marginalized communities. Finally, we should mention that, the, that our Minnesotans of Asian descent are experiencing new levels of racism and overt physical threats to their safety due to the racist terminology the previous presidential administration used to describe COVID-19. So in short, a lot of damage has happened. So what can we predict? Researchers have long studied the summer slide or the regression that happens when students are away from in-person learning for large periods of time. This research combined with the research on disrupted learning due to events like Hurricane Katrina or Christchurch New Zealand earthquakes allow us to predict four things. 
One, students will likely experience a slight regression in reading ability and a larger regression in mathematics. Two, learning loss will not be universal. Students from marginalized communities are likely to experience greater loss than students from non-marginalized communities. Third, academic losses are secondary at the moment to the collective trauma students are experiencing. Educators will need to account for these issues before any learning inter interventions can occur. Our members always like to say you have to Maslow before you can bloom. We have to meet the basic needs of our students before we can get them to fractions. Finally, research has consistently shown that with quality programming, the students who experience the most learning loss are also the students that make the quickest gains once they're back with qualified licensed teachers. So what can we do? Four things that I'd like to point out to you. First, the legislator should fund quality extra time programming. But let me be clear about what this means. This is not a rushed dash to summer school. Extra time programming only works when it is equitable and conducted by qualified educators. The legislature will need to provide the funding for educators trained in culturally responsive pedagogy to create the appropriate program for their particular populations of students. The legislator will also need, legislature will also need to fund equitable transportation so all students can access this programming. Second, we will need funding for socio-emotional programming so our educators can help students process the collective trauma of the past two years. Third, we must embrace a do no harm approach to school finance. Districts should not be penalized due to declining enrollments as a result of this pandemic. This is the moment we need to keep educators in classrooms and keep class sizes small. Finally, we must close this digital divide. There is wide bipartisan support for this effort in the state legislature, and it is time to capitalize on that and give every student access to high-speed internet and an appropriate device for digital learning. So we'll be able to answer specifics about the data after our presentation, but I would now like to pass it to my colleague, uh, Virginia Mancini, who's going to offer some more insight on extra time programming. Thank you, Dr. Killian. Ms. Mancini, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Virginia Mancini and I'm coming to you live from Matamidi Middle School where I teach seventh grade, but I have a seventh grader who goes to St. Louis Park Middle School, so go Orioles. Um, I think I'd like to start with my experience teaching both distance learning and hybrid. The two most challenging parts of online teaching were the dead screen and the ghosting. For many reasons, I allowed my students to turn off their cameras, but that meant I was speaking to a wall of profile pictures, most of which were like SpongeBob, professional athletes, and their pets. Teaching is really about a performance art, and we read the room and respond according to what we read. And with online teaching, we just couldn't do that. So sometimes I had no idea how my instruction was being received. The second hardest challenge of online teaching was the ghosting. Students would either stop showing up, stop responding to questions, stop responding to emails, or just stop turning in assignments. It forced us to look at student engagement in whole new ways and really on a whole new level. And I think that is one bright spot of distance learning. Student engagement shouldn't be about students sitting quietly listening to a teacher. Student engagement happens when students take ownership of their reading and their learning. From distance learning, we learned new ways to foster student autonomy and agency which helped to foster resiliency and persistence. Although there are some bright spots of distance learning, my fear is that they were not equitably distributed or received. I know my stu students have experienced learning loss. I can see it very clearly in their writing and reading abilities. But the solution to the problem will take creativity as well as commitment. In the spring, we quickly learned that one size fits all does not work. We needed the freedom and the flexibility to meet unique students for their unique educational needs. And that took a lot of time and money and the students are better for it. As we transition back into in-person learning, we need the resources to continue to be nimble and flexible. That's a quote from Cornelius Minor, who's like this outstanding national educator because we need to continue to meet unique learning needs for each student. That is why I'm recommending that districts receive more money to create equitable extended time learning programs. 
these programs have to be led by a licensed qualified teacher. We know the data is there that the most impact on a student's learning is the teacher that's in front of them. But we also have to pay attention to other barriers such as transportation, food assistance, and childcare. Most of my middle school students and my former high school students can't attend extended learning time programs because they're taking care of their younger brother or sister. But most importantly, districts need resources to continue to support trauma-informed teaching. There are so many unknowns and teachers need the training to recognize and respond to community trauma that all students have faced, but only some have received support for. Mental health issues should be the number one priority of all districts. And we can't face this challenge without the financial help of state legislatures. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mancini. Uh, next on my list is Kara Radke. Ms. Radke, please introduce yourself for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. All right, thank you. My name is Kara Radke, um, and I thank you, Mr. Chair and members of committee. I am the student and family advocate, the homeless liaison, the building 504 coordinator, and co-coordinator for the migrant program in the Monticello schools. I am also a racial equity advocate through FIRE Cohort 3, a proud member of Education Minnesota. And as of this summer, I'm a co-founder and education chair of the Wright County Coalition Against Racism. Today, I will address the digital divide, the racial inequities and the effects on special education students, particularly students of color receiving special education services, along with staff in all those categories um, during COVID-19. As we have mentioned, Minnesota has a troubling digital divide and it is, and it disproportionately harms people of color and people in greater Minnesota. The digital divide is the result of having slow internet connectivity and or lack of access to a device needed to conduct distance learning. And let me be direct, cell phones, iPads, they do not count as appropriate devices. Um, as my colleagues have noted, 11% of teachers and 28% of students in Minnesota are without access to high-speed internet. Most of my students live in Wright County, and we are very lucky by comparison. Only 9% of households in our school district do not have access to base level internet speed needed for online. I myself am an educator. I'm married to an educator. And we have two children, so two learners in our household. The four of us cannot um, successfully do our work or teach our classes when we are all trying to do so from our home. However, these figures are not anything to celebrate, even though we're within the lucky numbers out in Wright County. Our community has a growing Latinx population, and we know that a disproportionate portion of our community members without internet access are our neighbors of color. We will never solve the racial opportunity gaps that plague our schools if all of our children do not have adequate access to meet the current demands of online learning. Not to mention how difficult it is to attempt to learn online when you have language barriers, ability barriers, such as if you are deaf and hard of hearing, um, and the perpetuation of the system pushing white culture onto families that are only trying to survive this pandemic. For example, we have many older students in several different cultural backgrounds that need to help out around the house. They need to help take care of their younger siblings and make sure they're getting their education as well. That just adds extra stress to our learners. Beyond the digital divide, legislatures need to offer solutions for the growing mental health crisis in our schools. Too much of the conversation about the COVID slide is focused solely on academic learning loss. Our students are facing unprecedented levels of chronic stress, housing insecurity, and hunger. And I can totally attest to that because I am the homeless liaison and I have filled out way more homelessness reports within the school year. <clears throat> so, to, or there we go, sorry. Our, Students are facing, or I said that. So the murder of George Floyd this summer and the following civil unrest has shown the world that our students of color leave their homes each and every day fearing for their personal safety. 
This pandemic has uncovered the mass inequities that have too long plagued our public schools. This is the time for this legislature to hear the voices of all learners and to capitalize on the bipartisan support. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my spot. Um, on the bipartisan support for broadband expansion and provide universal access to high-speed internet. This means giving every child a device suitable for online learning. They also need to fund programs and resources so that educators can assess and repair the socio-emotional health of students, as well as return to in-person learning. This will require extra programming, additional staff, and above all patients. We also need this legislature to to end high stakes testing and once and for all reevaluate the white middle class standards by which we judge all students. This is not a one size fits all. Benchmarks and thresholds must be revised to reflect the diversity and humanity of all of our students. We have been through an indescribable year, but we have also been given the opportunity to reimagine public education in Minnesota help us build stronger schools that meet the needs of all students, regardless of race, zip code, socioeconomic status, faith, gender, ability, or sexual orientation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Radke. Uh, next up with, a, I think committee members will find this to be a unique perspective, uh, Marty Schofield from the Lino, Lake, Lino Lakes Correctional Facility. Mr. Schofield, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. My name is Marty Schofield, and I am an adult basic education teacher with the Minnesota Department of Corrections at Lina Lakes. As a community member, it is important that we educate students safely that limits the spread of COVID-19. At my workplace, I am offered abundant PPE, daily temperature checks before entering work, and free PCR testing when there's a COVID outbreak. Every school in Minnesota deserves the same safety protections that I have. When congressional leaders take these necessary steps, Minnesota and its communities will be able to overcome the coronavirus. As a parent, it is important that our children are able to continue the education with minimal disruption throughout the school year. I'm a father of twins in sixth grade. Every time their school changes learning models it is a disruption to my children's education. Not only are schedules altered, but actual learning time is diminished while preparing for the next learning model. Finally, as an educator, it is important that we provide a top-notch education to our students, regardless if classes are online, in person, or in a hybrid model. When I look at my colleagues doing amazing work given the circumstances, I know many are nearing their breaking point. In reality, many are being asked to do two jobs, teaching students in class while teaching others through distance learning. For example, Eric, a special education teacher at my work site, teaches multiple adult basic education classes, high school curriculum to youthful offenders, and conducts small group and individual instruction to students who are on his special education caseload. I'm not sure how much longer Eric will be able to continue teaching like this, but one thing's for certain, he and so many other teachers need to be able to take care of themselves as they provide the very best education to our students. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented challenges to our schools, our economy, and our families. Students and educators must be equipped with the tools and resources they need for effective instruction. With your help, we will have the funding to support the safety, health, and well being of both students and educators. The coronavirus is tough, but we are tougher. We will overcome this pandemic and make our schools even better for our schools than they were before. We have the will and we have the creativity. We have the determination to make it happen. Now we just need the resources. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Schofield. Members, uh, you see the agenda is broken out into sections today with, with panels uh, of presenters. I'd like to take questions after each panel. So if members have questions for 
this first group, please uh, indicate uh, on the app or uh, by email to Ms. Burke. I do see one uh, member already, Representative Feist. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a question for Dr. Killian. Um, Dr. Killian said that one of the areas where we need to focus uh, is on creating quality extra time programming. And my question to him is, in his expertise, where should we best direct funding? Should it be directly to the schools or would it be just as effective to direct it towards nonprofit partner organizations? Thank you. Dr. Killian? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for the question. Um, so our recommendation, um, so I want to answer your question in two ways. Number one, the districts need adequate funding to be able to put their most qualified teachers in this extra time programming. Um, and so our first priority is that, getting uh, ESPs and educators that know their student populations very well and are trained in culturally responsive pedagogies into those programs because the research is very direct. If you don't have qualified teachers and qualified educators leading this, it's not going to work. Now, there are some really great um, nonprofits out in the world that also do extra time programming in our schools when we're not in a global pandemic. Um, those things could also supplement what we're asking for. And so I don't think it's an either or, I think it's a both and, right? Uh, we certainly need to see our members in front of these uh, students and offering this equitable programming. Um, but as far as like a third party uh, doing some additional kind of like reading core situation or something like that, um, I mean, that's probably also a, a great additional uh, overlay on top of what we're already asking for. Representative Feist, follow up? I don't have any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Thompson. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, my question was uh, to the representative from Lionel Lakes Correctional Facility, um, because I, I heard him speak about uh, effective instructions inside the correctional facility, but also know that uh, are you for First of all, uh, uh, with all due respect, uh, historically, um, our community, especially the African American community, uh, historically uh, have been at the top when it comes to the achievement gap and the opportunity, uh, the opportunities should be endless for everybody, but it seems not to be that way for, for people of color. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in what type of training programs do you have? What type of programs and effective instruction do you have? Because I've never seen the Department of Corrections correct any uh, behavior. I've seen, you know, they should change their name. So I, I just wanted to just ask that question. Mr. Schofield? Yes, uh, thank you, Representative Thompson, for your question. So at Lionel Lakes, we have uh, four licensed teachers and three of us to teach adult-based education, and one of us teaches um, vocational education. So all of us, again, are licensed. And so we have a combination of different programs of uh, GED, uh, high school uh, diploma, and adult diploma. And our vocational teacher also teaches um, uh, CTEC, which is a hard wiring and cabling program. And when students complete that program, after they've graduated from their secondary credential, they're actually able to start earning $20 per hour coming right out of prison. Representative Thompson, follow up. Is there an opportunity in the uh, correctional facilities? And I, I guess I'm asking to expand on the vocational. Is there something that you guys, that's something you're looking at and looking forward to doing or, you know, is that, in the pipeline. And I'm not just talking at Lionel Lake. So I guess I should be asking this to, to the Department of Corrections and not, not you, know, you, but is that something that you advocate for, I should say? I, I can tell you, oh, sorry. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the Assistant Commissioner of, of Corrections, Daniel Karpowitz, he is a big proponent of vocational education. So I do believe that in this current administration, there's going to be a, a greater emphasis of, uh, of expanding and offering additional uh, vocational programming at the various sites. 
Thank you, Mr. Schofield. Representative Thompson, I'd urge you to uh, explore more with the Department of Corrections. Uh, next members uh, will transition to looking at the full, full service community school model. Uh, Ms. Starr, if you'd please introduce yourself to the committee and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, good morning chair and committee members. My name is Renee Starr and I have had the pleasure of serving youth and families from Brooklyn Center Community Schools as the youth programs manager for about two years and as the community schools manager for about two weeks. Brooklyn Center has operated as a community school district for the last 10 years and through over 100 partnerships. We offer robust community engagement high quality out of school time learning opportunities, co-located mental and physical health services, and have the agility to continually assess and meet the needs of our community. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed a great number of inequities in our country and affected BIPOC communities disproportionately and devastatingly. Over 90% of our students are students of color and Brooklyn Center has consistently had some of the highest COVID rates in Hennepin County. The pandemic has also made clear the great number of things schools are expected to provide for students and families beyond an academic education. I'd like to share some of what we've provided for students and families in the last year and make it very clear that we were poised to meet the needs of our community only because we are a community school district with a devoted staff team and strong established partnerships. With our partner, the Brooklyn Bridge Alliance for Youth, we distributed devices for online learning to every single student in our district aligned internet services for families, conducted door-to-door -door and phone outreach, delivered over 200 sports packs containing equipment for families to get active, PPE and information on COVID, and are launching a mobile health center, which has already provided flu shots and winter weather gear to members of the community. With Brookdale, a Hennepin County library, we delivered over 100 book club kits and hosted four book distribution days. With Bikes for Kids, we distributed 123 bikes and around 250 backpacks. With the Good Acre and Sheridan story, we have distributed evening and weekend food and produce to supplement what our nutrition services department provides. A number of our mental health providers have collectively offered over 1,000 mental health appointments. We've seen over 100 patients in the Health Resource Center, have offered two dental clinics per month, and have provided prescription glasses for 35 students since August. By the way, if you've never witnessed a kid put on prescription lenses for the first time and see the details in the back, their backpack design or something on the opposite wall, you're personally invited to come volunteer at our next vision clinic when we're back in person. It will give you life, I promise. We have helped families align housing assistance with the Northwest Hennepin Family Services Collaborative and helped families who lost jobs and benefits align health insurance with Portico. I'd like to point out that many of our partners have reached out to us since the pandemic started. We have the students and families that they're struggling to access in this current reality. Our contracts have supported partner organizations and independent contractors throughout the pandemic, highlighting the fact that our partnerships are mutually beneficial and help to sustain a vibrant and healthy community. The community schools model was effective prior to COVID. The holistic approach has helped our diverse student body make academic gains with several subpopulations outperforming the state in graduation rates and our graduation rate as a whole remaining above the state average for seven years in a row. The community school model uniquely positioned us to respond to the public health crisis we face and continue to meet the needs, the social, emotional, and health related needs of our community. And it's reinforced for me the belief that this model should be accessible to all young people and families in our state. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you, Ms. Starr. And I see several members have questions. Representative Jordan. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Starr, for your, for your work and your testimony. Um, I've been lucky enough to tour Brooklyn Center High School and can and have managed to actually tour your vision clinic. And as someone who has very bad vision, I can also agree that watching a child put on glasses for the first time is it I mean I'm getting teared up even thinking about it it's so magical but um so thank you for your work can you talk a little bit about what what additional resources you needed to be able to convert um your service your full service community school model into um accommodating the Brooklyn Center uh community during a pandemic so how did how long did it take you to get that going to be able to 
coordinate with your partners um, and do all of this work? And what other resources did that require? Ms. Stark? Sure, thank you, Chair and committee members. Um, you know, I don't want to pay, paint a fal false image that we could immediately pivot or anything like that. Um, things have been trying for all of us. I will say that um, because we had so many established relationships with strong organizations who already share the same vision at us as us, we were we were able to pivot pretty quickly. Um, I would say come summer program, um, which is an expanded learning opportunity that we've heard about some already this morning. Uh, I feel like we had our feet under us quite a bit. Um, and again, that is because those partnerships were established already and we did not have to go out and seek those out or um, find folks in the community with resources to you know, supplement what we could provide for our community. Representative Jordan, follow up. Yes, I, I mean, I want one of the Brooklyn Center High School is not in my district. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, but one of the dental providers that is a partner of Brooklyn Center has talked about how not only um, was the ability to also continue to provide um, dental care to children um, at Brooklyn Center was part of it, but having those existing connections allowed them to find more children who needed dental care and maybe were falling off the map where they wouldn't have been during the pandemic. So I, again, thank you so much, Ms. Starr, and thank you to the Brooklyn Center community for supporting this school. I think it really is a shining example. And I do encourage people to tour uh, Brooklyn Center High School when that is safe, because it's, I, I think it's a really, it's a life-changing decision to think about, a, a really life-changing experience to see what we can provide for schools and what that means for the community. So I can't thank you enough for your work and everything you've done. So thank you so much. Representative Joachim. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Starr. Just to kind of continue on with this conversation, I want to thank you as well for all the work you've done. If I can remember right, you were one of the first full-service community schools in our state, I believe. And um, it, you know, we now have hard data to show us how in, how influential the work that you can do with those private partner public partnerships can help our students learn because they don't come in pieces. One of the questions I had to kind of layer on to what uh, Representative Jordan said, um, you have said that those existing partnerships that had been built was one, of the, was one of the key reasons why you were able to pivot even though you still needed extra, you know, it took extra, it's taken extra for all of us to get through COVID. But how long do you think, um, how long did it take to build those private partner relationships? I, I don't want to get away from the fact um, that one of the reasons we need the investment from the state for full service community schools is because it does take time and energy to build those relationships. So maybe um, go back in your time machine a bit and talk about starting out that program and um, what it took to, how long it took to build those. This don't just happen overnight. Ms. Starr. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Um, yeah, you are absolutely right. Um, these partnerships don't just form overnight. And as someone who's only been with the district for two years, many of our partnerships were established long before I came to the district. Um, and I do just want to highlight how important the personal relationships are. I've, you know, been lucky to be there for two years and have had the chance to make personal connections. Um, we have a community partner who supported our after school program by offering basketball programming. And he's been with us for a few years now. And unfortunately, without having students in person, he's not able to offer programming on our behalf, but he still does in the community. And we have students still attending his programming. Um, and because he had a personal relationship with some of our staff, a student that he was seeing needed glasses and he emailed us to make that happen when we were able to get glasses for that student. So, um, you know, it's the partner organization relationships and also the personal relationships um, that are fostered over time. And, you know, many of them have been um, being established long, you know, long before my time um, in Brooklyn Center. 
Representative Yuakim, follow up? No, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Starr, thank you for your time today. Uh, members, next we have two school counselors to talk about, uh, actually three, pardon me, uh, correct myself, to talk about that experience of Ms. Kaylee Herlovsky and Lara, Lara I hope, uh, Hake from the Osseo School District, and then Lael Story from Deer River. Uh, Ms. Herlovsky, Ms. Hake, please introduce yourself for the record in, in whatever order you choose and proceed with your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Ms., uh, Kaylee Herlovsky. And my name is Lara Hake. And we are counselors at Northview Middle School and Osseo Area Schools. Today, we are going to share with you a little bit about our role as school counselors and our priority work for the upcoming school year. School counselors work with all students and we are often the first point of contact for students and families for support. In Osseo area schools, counseling is a comprehensive K-12 program that aligns with the American School Counselor Association standards. When supporting students, the key areas that school counselors focus on are academic, social emotional, and college and career development. We support students in these areas through individual counseling, small group counseling, and classroom lessons. Some of the creative ideas that we've implemented in response to distance learning are counseling websites with calming resources, self-paced small group op counseling opportunities, pop-up events ranging from stress management strategies to virtual college tours and virtual office hours. We know that in order for a student to be successful, we must focus on the whole child. As Lara stated earlier, school counselors are often family's first point of contact. Just as our most important role is to advocate for our students, it's equally important that we advocate for their families. This includes putting their voices and perspectives into the space at a district level. It also includes helping to foster relationships between families and other school staff by serving as the bridge between families and teachers when communicating student needs. Counselors play a key role in providing communication and information regarding transitions between school levels, and we also often serve as the 504 case managers for our buildings. We work with students, families, and school staff to create and establish systems and accommodations to support student needs. We support families in crisis in a multitude of ways, including providing resources, offering a listening ear, and assisting in facilitating difficult conversations between students and their families when needed. In addition to mental health, we also connect families to resources regarding technology, internet, attendance, meals, and housing. School counselors can be found in every facet of the school community, from facilitating student leadership programs and other student groups, to providing staff trainings and restorative practices and suicide prevention, to serving as a larger, um, serving on larger building initiatives and committees like crisis teams and positive behavior interventions and supports. School counselors and many buildings are seen as big impact leaders, often creating school-wide systems to support students, teachers, and families. Another impact school counselors have on the school community is through supporting our teachers and educational support staff. This pandemic and change in learning models has not only impacted our students and families, but also our school staff. Counselors have been working hard to support school staff by providing resources and serving as a listening ear to ensure that our fellow educators feel supported so they in turn can support our students. An example of this at Northview Middle School is that throughout this school year, counselors have been leading staff in trauma sensitive schools training to help staff recognize and understand the impact of trauma on our students and how we can work together to best support our students and families who have experienced trauma. As many people have um, already stated today, this year has been hard on our students, our families, and our school communities. As we discussed as a K through 12 counseling team um, in Osseo, these were some of the key areas we observed students struggling with the most. Many students are feeling alone and isolated. The combination of not being in the school building, extracurricular activities and sports being canceled, and many students unable to see their families or go to public spaces have made students and staff have an overwhelming sense of loneliness. We know that students experiencing trauma need predictability. The uncertainty of this year has been an added layer of stress for all students and especially students who have experienced trauma in their lifetime. High school students are hesitant to make firm plans looking towards life after high school and are having to rethink their paths in many cases. The lack of routine and structure that the school provides are having a large impact on students' academic and social-emotional well-being. Many students are reporting disruptive 
interrupted sleep patterns, which can affect their mood, physical health, mental health, and their ability to focus and concentrate in their classes. This combined with increased technology use, lack of activity and movement, and in some cases, lack of adult supervision during the school day is impacting the student's success both in and outside of the classroom. Similar to feeling isolated, students are really missing their friends. At Northview, the three of us counselors conducted minute meetings the week before moving to the full distance model to ensure our students were set up for success as they entered distance learning. One of the questions we asked was, what has been the hardest thing for you so far this year? An overwhelming amount of students said not being able to see their friends. We know friendships and socialization is important at every level. This is especially hard on our sixth graders and our ninth graders who transition to new buildings and new students to our district. Students are struggling to consistently and actively engage in their classes and all students are experiencing grief and loss on some level with all of the changes that this past year has had. Loss of their old way of life, a loved one, or a friendship. Distance learning is challenging not only for students, but for parents who are working from home or working outside of the home and trying to adjust to being the main supervisor of their scholars while trying to balance their lives. Some students thrive like we know during this independent learning while others find this extremely difficult. Students who are struggling um, academically prior to distance learning are struggling even more and that gap is widening. It is difficult to get students to show up to interventions um, to get extra help and when they are behind it's difficult to get them caught up. This will be a huge focus in planning next year on how we address student academic needs but it's also going to be important that we focus on addressing mental health needs early on as this has also been a challenge during this time. Our big picture priorities that are shown here have been identified as solutions to supporting our students throughout the coming school year and they continue to evolve as we work to meet our students needs. We use an equity lens to consider how the pandemic and changes in learning models are impacting our students in different ways and how we will need to respond to meet these varied student needs. We know that this next year will be challenging for students, for families, and the greater school community to transition to post-pandemic school environment. As school counselors, we will be intentional in creating systems of support for each student and family to successfully navigate their path in regard to academic, social, emotional, and college and career readiness. Some specific examples of these systems of support could be school-wide programs for rebuilding community and relationships among students, staff, and the greater school community. At Northview, these programs often take place in advisory, which is our homeroom support system, and counselors are the ones that adapt and create these community building programs that each student feels like they belong in our school community. Equitable access and resources to help students fully engage in school again is also a priority. This includes access to a school counselor, mental health support, and connecting families to greater community resources that will meet their basic needs. School counselors can lead classroom and individual lessons to teach and reteach specific academic skills to help our students um, get back to speed and be um, feeling confident about their skills in in-person school again. Our communities have experienced a wide range of trauma, ranging from the pandemic to the murder of George Floyd and the events in our communities that followed to the loss of sense of normalcy and social supports. School counselors are uniquely positioned to anticipate and respond to the mental health needs of our students in the wake of this traumatic year. For example, at Northview, our caseloads are small enough that we know every single student in our building. These relationships allow us to provide personalized, equitable and responsive support to meet our students wherever they're at. Some of these supports could look like social emotional um, counseling groups focused on self-regulation, a series of interventions to support individual mental health needs, and small groups using restorative practices framework to process community trauma. We know that successful transitions to middle school and high school are critical for healthy development for students and school counselors play a key role in facilitating these transition programs to ensure that the school experience is positive for all of our new students. And lastly, the world has looked incredibly different over the course of this last year, and there are many factors impacting how students view their future, such as the financial stress that many of our families are experiencing right now, along with the reduced self-confidence that many of our students are feeling, their ability to be successful in their classes. Given these challenges and the stress of the year, we are focusing on college and career development starting as early as elementary and middle school so that our students are prepared for whichever post-secondary options they choose. The role of a school counselor can look different based on the caseload ratios, and these caseload ratios are one of the biggest factors in how counselors can impact success in their school community. 
At Northview, we are fortunate that our principal is able to use compensatory funding to buy up two additional counselors to keep our ratios low. And this is what allows us to be proactive in addressing these solutions for our students, our families, and our school community. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for your time and attention. Ms. Herlovsky and, and Ms. Haig, thank you for, for your time. Uh, Ms. Storley, good to see you. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Leal Storley. I'm a school counselor mm -hmm. at Deer River High School. When we're all in the building, our school houses 456 through 12th grade students. Our school district covers 540 square miles in northern rural Minnesota. We meet the ratio at our school for school counselors, the recommended ratio. As we went into the hybrid model um, at the start of this academic school year, that gave us the opportunity to support our students' developmental well being by making sure that they were matched with peers that they had friendly relationships with, that represented the diversity of our school, and that um, was a very inclusive way for them to be able to be in school on a part-time basis. As a school counselor, the goal is to be comprehensive while serving all school students. The three main areas of focus are social emotional support, academic support, and career support. Working with students is done in group settings, classroom settings, on an individual level, and on a systematic level. Group information sessions or classroom lessons cover topics such as coping strategies, mental health awareness, career exploration, academic strategies, to name a few. Individual meetings with students cover the three areas and are often driven by individual student needs, helping to support them with the ultimate goal of feeling safe and supported in school. On a systematic level, school counselors are responsible for providing information to families, school staff, and the community on issues that are impacting students, as well as strategies on how to support our students. School counselors support students by offering relevant professional development for school staff. There are certainly no typical days as a school counselor. As I reflected about my week last week, Thursday, I started the day doing mindfulness lessons to help develop coping skills in our middle school students, followed by individual counseling sessions with high school students who were having a difficult time and the afternoon was filled with scholarship support and career conversations with seniors. In between, there are phone calls with parents who are looking for resources or support for their students. We have been creative with virtual meth methods and work to maintain social distancing while we continue to, support, to strive to support all students during the pandemic. We don't even fully know what students and families will need as we come out of the pandemic into a new education world. School counselors are experts on their students. We know who they are and what they need. Our training is vital to student success and their well-being. Students who have access to a school counselor have access to a trained mental health professional who know them and are advocates for their well-being, present and future. School counselors are often the point of contact for families on many issues and we were able to provide connections to resources to support students in the three areas of careers, social emotional and academic development. Our students and families need these supports in order to be successful in education. Thank you for listening to me today. Thank you very much to the three of you for your testimony before the committee today. Are there any questions from members? It appears not at this time. Uh, members, our next uh, two speakers will speak uh, as anti-racist educators. I want to welcome Stephanie Toffin and Jacob Lawrence uh, to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you for being here today. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Um, thank you for taking this time to listen. My name is Stephanie Toppin, and I teach fifth grade at Hilltop Elementary in Invergrove Heights. I've been an educator for 24 years. Now is the time to make real beneficial changes in education. I want to share three challenges and opportunities from this past year 
and places where the legislator could uh, could take changes, could make changes uh, to support our students. The first is class size. This year I've been fortunate to have 18 to 21 students teaching in a trauma inflicted school, low class sizes provide students with individualized attention and instruction. Teachers are able to reach the individual <clears throat> needs of students and support families. Three years ago, I had a class of 18. This was purposeful due to the needs of the students. After years of failed interventions, the positive change came from the class size. Social emotional needs started being met, attendance improved, self-esteem grew, and academic growth increased. Sadly, our district was not able to financially continue with low class sizes. The following year, I saw the reverse. Class size increased, behaviors increased, the ability to individualize student instruction was unmanageable. In order to make connections with students and families and provide what every student deserves comes from a lower class size. We all know it. If you're serious about closing the achievement gap and discipline disparities, class size is where you should start. Another positive change that occurred this year and allowed teachers to reach all students was our Wednesday preparation day. Students received asynchronous enrichment and intervention and teachers were able to schedule one-on-one -on -one and small groups without trying to juggle 25 to 30 other students at the same time. We were able to connect with families and provide support. Teachers were able to participate in meaningful professional development during the workday. Teachers need this time. Preparing and communicating and reaching all students and family is a part of our job, not just the delivery of content. A third change is real and honest and hard work when it comes to creating an anti-racist school system. One of the professional development areas that our teachers have led and participate in in our Wednesdays is Bar We, Building Anti-Racist White Educators. Bar We is built on the belief that all white educators must take an active role in the dismantling of white supremacy in our schools, communities, and in ourselves. The group emphasizes that we as white educators can't rely on our colleagues of color to be the only ones challenging white supremacy in our education system. While the title is specific to white educators, Bar We is welcoming of all staff. We meet monthly for reading and inquiry series. During our meetings, the goal is to study and reflect on our identity and place in this system, push and equip educators to address their own unconscious biases and to work on building an anti-racist system that nurtures, nurtures the social, emotional and academic well-being of our students, as well as the professional well-being of our colleagues. There are many changes that need to be made in our school system. These are just three, but it's time to get creative and find a way to make real changes that benefit all students. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Tofton. Mr. Lauren, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair and representatives, good morning. Um, First, want to say uh, thank you to my colleagues who presented today and well done. My name is Jacob Lorenz and I am the Climate Coordinator for Duluth Public Schools, ISD 709. A year ago, I and other, others from Piedmont Elementary testified on the impact that becoming more trauma-informed has had on our students. Piedmont's journey began with the entire staff completing a comprehensive needs assessment with the help of Ed Minnesota, this 123 question survey focused on the needs of students and staff and what was seen as having the biggest impact on student success. The results were clear. Poor student attendance and unmet mental health needs were identified as the two major factors affecting student performance. We then further broke down our data and found, simply put, our students weren't coming to school enough and not coming to school has consequences. For example, in grade four, of those students who missed 10 or more days, 84.88% did not meet an MCA reading. 
and 70.59% did not meet in math. Data drives decisions. We shared data from the needs assessment, attendance data, office discipline referrals, and suspensions. We then began several incentives to improve attendance and professional development to support work with students who have experienced significant trauma. Our trauma-informed professional development began with the viewing of Paper Tigers and a follow-up discussion on what we could learn from the movie. Additional staff development time and staff meetings were utilized to complete work around how well staff knew students school-wide and what trends and concerns could be identified from that information and how we could use that information in developing better connections with students. In addition, a small group of staff attending conferences centered on trauma. We have seen momentous improvements in as well as significant decrease in discipline referrals and suspensions. Comparing data from before and after doing trauma work, this is what we found. Students who have missed three or more days have went from 38% to 11% for K-5. Office discipline referrals decreased 47%. Out-of-school suspensions decreased 60%. In-school suspensions decreased by 70%. We are getting our kids to school more and, and we are doing a better job of keeping them in the classroom. Now in a district role, I'm excited by what increasing funding for trauma responsive schools could mean to mean to more schools and our Duluth community as a whole. As a district, we are identified by the Department of Human Rights for our discipline gap. We have to improve. Black students are 25% of our out-of-school suspensions, but are 5% of our student population. Special education students are 45%, while only 19% of our population. When looking at students living in poverty, this sub subgroup represents 85% of out-of-school suspensions while being 38% of our population. It is important that all staff in Duluth Public Schools receive trauma-informed training, training. We believe that every adult, every adult, including paraprofessionals, contributes to creating a place where children can feel safe, welcome, and loved. Staff, just like students, want the tools and resources to be successful. Educating students has become a profession that is far more than teaching the content areas. Students have to be present both physically, mentally, and emotionally, and we have to be able to help them in all these things. I have shown you that trauma-informed work has helped Piedmont reduce disparities. As this pandemic ends, we know kids have experienced more trauma, and that as we get back to in-person learning, I hope you can support more trauma-informed school funding so we can better continue this work on a grander scale, especially now. Lastly, I would like to thank Representative Richardson and Representative Kresha for signing onto the trauma bill last session and for Chair Davney hearing trauma le legislation this coming Thursday. Thank you very much for your time and all you do. Thank you, Mr. Laurent. Members, questions? The, uh, the chair will take this as an opportunity then. Uh, I'm gonna go out a little bit on a limb here uh, and say that uh, both of you, uh, Ms. Toffin and Mr. Laurent, uh, appear to be white, but we're talking about anti-racist education here. And Ms. Toffin, you touched on this some in your testimony. Can you correct me if I'm wrong and then just speak a little bit more about uh, since 90 some percent of Minnesota teachers are do identify as white, uh, what that means for more holistic classrooms for our, for Minnesota students? Sure. Um, well, I can only speak from my experience and I, um, I take part mm -hmm. in attending bar we, um, but I, I don't head it up. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I look at my students and know that um, half of them don't come to school seeing versions of themselves. They see um, most, mostly white teachers and we're starting to see a change, but definitely not the change that we need to see. And I think that um, speaking from being a white educator um, in, in Minnesota, my, the way I grew up and the way I learned and when I look at um, my background and what I expect of my students 
in the past 24 years. I've learned a lot. And just to say that, um, you know, I, I teach American history and, and to see things from a different point of view and to sit back and listen and think about what story am I sharing and what am I expecting out of students when I absolutely have no idea what their lives are like um, and I can't compare. And so this work through Barwe is really providing me with an opportunity um, to see things from a different point of view, to um, sit back and listen more than talk, um, to hopefully provide students with the understanding that I'm not an expert. Um, they have a lot that they can bring to the table. I, I can answer that. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's a space we're all going to have to explore. Uh, so thank you for that. Mr. Laurent, uh, any response from you, sir? I think you, I think you bring up a great point. If, if our staffing is 97% white, right? That is a problem that cannot be fixed in a day. Um, that's going to take decades of work. One thing we can work on right now is, is looking at our own biases and, and learning from our community. Um, one work that we, we engaged in at the beginning of this uh, current institutes and in, in anti-bias training, and that was for uh, certified and non-certified staff. Um, and so for all of us to, to even start with that understanding, I think is a really good foundation of, of leading this work going forward. Um, but as white educators, we need to learn from our communities and we need to take their feedback seriously um, and then change practices that have, have been institutionalized and, and stuck in our ways for decades. Thank you very much. Representative Thompson, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just have one quick, a couple quick questions for uh, um, Mr. Doreen and, uh, and, and, and Jacob Laurent. And uh, so I, I, don't, I hate to go back to historically, but historically, like I know for a fact, just watching uh, old movies that our ancestors were beat, they got caught learning. Uh, they were beat. Don't strung up by a tree and beat. If they get caught with a book, if they get caught reading or learning math, now we call it an achievement gap. I just want to say that and put that there. But then here's the other piece: um, the pandemic, uh, COVID nineteen. These kids, uh, they they witnessed the, the brutal murder of George Floyd, uh, the the uprising at the the U.S. Capitol. Then COVID affects my the families where. Some of the kids, their parents may have been laid off and not making the money, scared the rent moratorium, eviction, these are just problems. And then all of a sudden the schools open back up and we flood these kids into the school, right? I'm just going to name it like I know for a fact that we don't have culturally competent uh, um, mental health professionals or teachers. And that plays a part in the achievement gap. But then we complain about the achievement gap. Most of the times kids are getting suspended from school for just being kids, like doing some of the same things that they do at home. Probably don't have a dad at home. So we're not really, so I guess I, I, my question is, do you agree that we don't have enough black teachers, black administrators and, and, and black people in these, in these facilities to handle some culturally specific issues that arise out of, out of the African-American community? I, I don't see it and thus we have an achievement gap. I think we almost, creating felons, you know, excuse my branch delivery, but it is, it's definitely something that's always gonna be on my radar because my kids are part of, you know, we're part of the achievement gap. And you know, I know for a fact that I'm gonna be an old man and I want these kids to take care of me. This is my future I'm speaking about. And so I'm asking, do you agree that we need to get more culturally specific and in, in particular African-Americans? administrative staff, teachers who can actually deal with the kids. Uh, Ms. Toffin, Mr. Loren. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, that's that's 100 percent true. And and my my colleague, Ms. Toffin, hit it on on the head as well that um, when kids don't see representatives of themselves in in positions of, of power, um, you know, that that only makes that road that much more challenging. Um, and so increasing that, especially coming from a northern Minnesota school district where, um, you know, we, we see 
uh, diversity much less than in the cities, it, it's even more, in my opinion, pertinent. Um, and that is definitely something that that needs to be to be addressed. Um, and like I was saying before, it, it's not a, a snap of the fingers fix. That's that's a thing. So what can we do um, in the meantime to to continue this work moving forward? Um, but yes, I, I agree. We need we need more black principals. We need more black soups, and and we definitely need more black teachers. I agree with. Uh, I agree with what Mr. Lawrence was saying. Um, it's not going to be a snap of the fingers fix. Um, I I can only speak again from my my truth and what I know, and I truly feel that one of the reasons we don't see it is because school was not a pleasurable place. You know, they weren't, in, students weren't, you have to be inspired to want to be a teacher. And um, growing up and, and, you know, being a part of the education system for so many years, I can say, I look back at myself as a teacher and how I handled things incorrectly and not, now I'm, through Bar We and some of the equity work that we have done in our, our district. Um, how did I inspire kids to want to come to school and be a, be a part of the education system, become teachers, especially students who struggled maybe academically or behavioral and um, are black and brown students, you know? What was I doing to encourage them or to see things from their point of view and change myself as an educator? So I think that that's one of the things I'm learning about myself as a white woman in education is how am I going to change the way I approach things to make sure that school is a place that all of my students aspire to continue want to be a part of it, want to become teachers. Thank you, Ms. Toffin. Representative Thompson, a follow-up? It's almost like you want to ask, why is it every time you walk into the Black history class, you see a white teacher? It's almost like you want to ask that question. <laughs> how, do you, like, how does that work? You know, and, and, and so just to be clear, like with all due respect to both of you, because I do uh, appreciate the work that you do, mental health. I mean, I, I, I actually... Um, actually benefit from uh, mental health, uh, going to see mental, a mental health specialist. And I think that it's nothing wrong with talking to somebody. And so I, I definitely uh, want to uplift the work you do. Uh, my last, this is my last piece. Um, I came from the city of Chicago and I, I moved to Duluth, Minnesota. And so when I was in Duluth, Minnesota, it was a total culture shock for me when it came to my education. I party from Duluth to Superior, Wisconsin, just so that you know, like this, they didn't prepare me for school in Chicago and they didn't really uh, wanna teach me in Duluth, Minnesota. That's how I felt. And so here I am 40 something years old now and we're still going through the same, you know, with our kids. And I just wanna make it better for my kids and your kids and so, I, I look forward to working with anybody that wants to make it better for our youth. So I thank you for your work that you do. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Representative Richardson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you both for uh, presenting uh, today and, and sharing uh, information. You raised a number of good points and um, just a couple of, of points that I wanted to make around the discipline uh, disparities that are pretty persistent and that we continue to see. Uh, the details are really built into the discretion and the discretion that is there is where um, the disparities really, really fester. And so um, in education policy, we were talking yesterday about uh, school discipline disparities and had the opportunity to see some case studies of pretty similar sort of, um, uh, I guess we could call them behaviors, uh, that quote unquote, and how responses to those things um, can, can be different. And so it's, it's really helpful that uh, to hear as you're 
continuing to work on addressing uh, those discipline disparities. It's great to hear that those numbers are coming down. It would be really interesting to see how those numbers are continuing to look as you break that down by uh, race as well. I got a little bit of, uh, of a flavor of that, but in terms of how it's um, decreasing overall, it's always really helpful to see those uh, distinctions. And it was also helpful to hear um, you know, as you laid out the number of black students that you have and the percentages versus um, the suspension rates. I'm always struck by the data within the indigenous community where you have 1.6% uh, of the student population uh, and being 10 times more likely to be suspended. So we know for sure that there's a deep problem and a deep issue there. And I appreciate you both being committed uh, to that. In terms of the teacher diversity piece as well, I also just wanna uplift um, the, the history and the legacy of the fact that um, there were times where we had more diverse teachers within the classroom and that there have been historical decisions and policies um, made that pushed uh, uh, particularly black teachers out of classrooms. Um, Brown versus Board of Education was definitely a win for uh, uh, desegregation, but losing 38,000 black teachers in the aftermath of that is an important legacy that we need to continue to push up. And I think we also need to continue to lift up the fact that those teachers that were pushed out, you know, based on the history and what we know, those were highly qualified black teachers who are oftentimes more qualified than their white counterparts when they were being pushed out of the classroom. And um, that doesn't even speak to the 90% of black administrators like principals and others who were pushed out of schools following uh, that, that ruling. And then moving even further to um, uh, the 80s where we had changes within our licensing uh, system, we lost another 21,000 uh, black teachers uh, with uh, with licensing uh, changes as well. And so there's been sort of this historical pattern and legacy of where we have, um, th that has brought us here today. So I think it's important to name that um, and lift that up. And I think that uh, analyzing that uh, history is going to be important as we think through the policy decisions that we want to push through uh, today and now to really be able to, to diversify our teaching workforce because the research tells us that a diverse uh, teaching pool is not only a benefit to the BIPOC students, but it actually helps all students uh, to do better. And so continuing, I think, to uh, to lift that piece up is going to be uh, very critical. So again, thank you for uh, all that you are doing and continuing to do and uh, look forward to continued conversations and work around this issue because we definitely have uh, a lot of work to do and it's great to have co-conspirators within this work. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Richardson, and thank you for your leadership on both the Education Policy Committee and through the Select Committee uh, that whose report came out recently. Uh, Representative Krisha, you get to bat cleanup today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you to the presenters. And uh, Ms. Hoffman, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I just want to follow up. Representative Richardson asked a couple of the questions that I actually wanted to just uh, get some clarity on. Uh, number one, I'm very interested in uh, the anti-racist name. Uh, how did that moniker come to be? Uh, I think that that's the first time I've heard that. So I don't know if that's just a designation or if that's a, a title that um, is being used to be helpful in this uh, as we look through this lens. The second thing is, um, and I, you know, in the interest of time, I'm very concerned uh, or very interested in your position on uh, what Representative Richardson said, and I'll just add this. How do we make sure our um, adherence to looking through a racial just lens doesn't push out quality teachers and uh, doesn't put us in a position where we're, we're switching the biases from diversity in the education to biases against quality teachers. And I think that those of us who've been teachers have all come up to the ranks because of mentorship. We've come up with somebody who inspired us. And you know, I'm very concerned about that, that we see good quality teachers moving up, but um, because we're trying to be very sensitive and very just in certain areas and using biases, we might make the wrong decision. Any thoughts on all of that and how that might affect hiring practices? Sure. 
I'm going to um, speak first to uh, talking about te the teacher part of it and inspiring, because I think that's really where you go. You want to inspire your students to follow their dreams. Um, I have had students in the past where I look at them and actually say, wow, you're going to make a great teacher one day. Whether they become a teacher or not, you can see kind of some of the skills that a teacher might have, their willingness to help others. Um, they work well. I've, we've had um, some very uh, different special education um, groups in our building. And so when I see my fifth graders um, just excel in going into other rooms and working with other students younger than them or different than them, that's when I really see something and I say, you'd be so good working with kids because they're doing it as fifth graders. I think inspiring children to continue their education and, and follow their dreams has nothing to do with whether or not you are hiring a diverse teachers, so to speak. I think what we need to do is make sure that we're inspiring all of our students. And hopefully in that, more students of color are going to want to inspire those and become teachers. They need that inspiration in us to push them forward. The hard part is, as a white woman, how do I inspire somebody very different than myself? And so um, that's where I kind of try to take part as much as I can in um, other avenues like Bar We. Um, and you asked a question, where did that come from? And so I'm actually reading from that because as I said, I take part in it. I'm not part of the team that organizes it. So it is a group, um, a national group formed by teachers in Philadelphia. And there are groups in schools all over the state and all over the country. So, um, and this has come from educators, uh, like it stands for, it's white educators, um, anti-racist white educators. So really looking within yourself and um, it can be hard. Like we attend these meetings and you see things within yourself, you read about things and you have to be willing to kind of push through some of those, <sighs> just speaking off, but some of the things that I realize I've done wrong as a person or um, looking things from a different point of view that I didn't realize were rude, incorrect, racist, and it exists in all of us. So I, I'm just trying to better myself. And that's how I look at it, is how, how can I be better than I was in the past? How can I inspire kids? How can I keep them wanting to come to school and make it enjoyable for them? I teach fifth grade. So I know what I teach my students is a foundation, but it is not, um, you know, they're not graduating with the information that I give them. So my job is to inspire them to want to know more, to keep at it. I hope Thank that answers the question. Representative Krisha, follow up. Uh, I, no, I, I guess my follow up comment was something you said in there, uh, Ms. Hoffman, and those. Many of us have been in the classrooms. Many of us have worked with kids. You don't have, you have to be an educator. And I think what you said is something that's a universal truth. And that is no matter who's in front of you, no matter the color or the makeup of the student or the demographic, understanding that student as a human being is still the largest universal quality that will move us forward uh, with our kids and our inspiration. And you know that's what I've learned. I, I think that are uh, paying attention to disparities, asking the questions, asking how we can do better is the right thing to do. I also think that asking ourselves when we're pushing too hard and when we need to just focus on the quality of a teacher and connect with a kid makes more sense um, is also equally important. So, so what you said is very important. I, I wanna thank you. And um, again, just connecting with those kids. I, I learned a long time ago that the best way to help a kid 
whether it's your own kid, my own kids, or kids I taught was, you go through every possible way to get to that kid to help them so they don't get lost. So thank you. Can I add to that then? I'm gonna yes. put one more Just talk. In. If you wanna connect with kids, you can't have a class of 30 kids. I mean, it's just, it's so hard. And if we really truly want to make these connections and, and be there for these students and reach them where they're at, we need to make it manageable. And 30 is not manageable. And I can't even fathom what high school and middle school have to deal with, you know, 30 times six classes a day. So we need to really look at if we're, if we really want to do the work, the first thing is to lower those class sizes. Thank you, Ms. Toffin. Uh, you. Members, this was a uh, excellent uh, panel today. I want to thank each of the panelists for taking time out of, of their day and sharing their, their perspectives and their wisdom with us. Uh, Representative Richardson, uh, you wanted to I'll just be, I'll be make a statement? Brief. Um, I think just leaving folks with the idea that what we need is an equal playing field and we need equal opportunity. We need equal opportunity to become a teacher. We need equal opportunity to be retained as a teacher. And we need an equal opportunity for our kids to be in the classroom. Because right now with the push out, we don't have that. And right now with the data that we can see from the, the teaching um, uh, demographics, uh, we, we don't have that. So this is not about um, pushing out quality teachers. It's about building a system that's designed to work for everyone uh, because until it's designed to uh, work for absolutely everyone, we will not be as prosperous as a state or as a nation. Thank you, Representative Richardson. Members, uh, this is the start of the conversation uh, for the session, not the end. I assume we'll be picking it up any number of times. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to chair this committee through these challenging and, and uh, hopeful, I hope, times. With that, members, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.